everybody, I'm Tom Vasso. Oh, wait, no. Uh, I'm Z Garcia. Hello. <laughs> Show. That's Sam Healy. What's up, folks? Bloop, bloop, bloop. You are two bloop, days bloop, early bloop, on that one. Bloop, 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 bloop. <laughs> All right, welcome to Dice Tower Dive, in which we go back and take a look at something from yesteryear or yesterday. Or um, yesterdecade. Yesterday. Well, this is a, a long one, uh, and time-wise for gaming, it basically covers almost my entire life. Uh, yours entire life it definitely for all of us and for most people who are gaming they don't remember a time when Mayfair games did not exist right. I think so Mayfair games <coughs> uh, who never really I think had a great logo but eh, it got better I guess as time went by slightly Mayfair games was founded in 1981 by Darwin Bromley who and, and hey, why are you stealing my facts man well, these are facts I Why knew. Why are you stealing my facts? Because <laughs> you, anyway, Darwin Brownway actually just passed away uh, a few months ago, and uh, he had a game that he wanted to bring to market, Empire Builder, and so started Mayfair Games. That was their first thing. They also started these uh, D and D supplements called Roll Aids, which don't seem to have taken off that much, as far as I can tell. Mm -hmm. I used to take Roll Aids when I was a kid. Yes, I knew this was going to happen. So. Where did the name Mayfair come from? They were hand acids. Do you know? Facts? Guy? Do you have it? Huh? Where did the name Mayfair come from? I don't care about that. Ah, right. It's actually a neighborhood in Chicago. Really? Yeah. Right. That's, That's where cool. he's from. You did not know that. You didn't say it? It's from Mayfair, yeah. <laughs> anyway, no, so he named it after <coughs> his, his company Mayfair. And so in the 80s, if you were buying American games that were not the mass market Parker Brothers Hasbro games and they weren't war games from Avalon Hill it was Mayfair probably there really wasn't much else uh, so when I looked online to see the most popular games from this time there was 1830 Mayfair helped bring some of the 18 we call them 18xx <laughs> games to America sure. uh, the um, a big stock market train games and there's still several hundred people who enjoy them to this day oh boy oh boy what that's true come on now a couple thousand. Yeah, like 18 XX number of people. <laughs> yeah. That would be interesting if there was, if you count up all the fans of 18 XX teams and there was 1837. Yeah. Yeah. Family business. Uh, take that card game, which I played a lot 15, yeah. 20 years ago. Yeah, mm -hmm. we used to play that a lot. So this was kind of the style of games that they did. Of course, the game that really brought them to the forefront when the company was made was Empire Builder. Empire Builder was a... Cran Rails game where you would draw on a board with crayons and it's a connection uh, game kind of, right? Yeah, and then you'd pick up goods, take them back and forth. This system was pretty solid to the point where they didn't change it for the next 30 years. Mm -hmm. Then and they didn't really change components either. Well, but you know, it was very popular there. There was a lot of different games. Uh, a house divided, they made some war games. Not heavy war games, but more of lighter style war games. And um, Euro Rails, they made a whole pile of these. That's just an example. That's the second most popular one. And then Barbarossa. Have you heard of this game? Yep. Mm -hmm. This is a, a clay modeling game where you want it to be good at modeling the clay, but not too good. Correct. And interestingly enough, this was like way before. There's so many party games that are like this now, yeah. where you want to be like, here's the clue, but not the best clue I can give. Mm -hmm. This was a very rare thing back in that time frame. It's a Klaus Teuber game. It was. In the 90s, this was all 80s stuff. In the 90s, they moved and made some other games. Probably their most famous game at this point was Modern Art, even though I'm showing the c -Mind cover there. I probably should have right. shown the Mayfair cover. Manhattan, <laughs> Intrigue, uh, Six Nymph. They started bringing games over, and that's because Mayfair, at this point in time, had an employee who changed the company a lot, and that's Jay Tumbleson. Now, Jay Templeson eventually went on to move and start his own company, Real Grande Games. Mm -hmm. But he helped Mayfair Games uh, basically work with companies from Europe and bring over those games. Mayfair was the first company to do that. Honestly, Real Grande probably overtook them in this department and brought more games. And that's a lot of the reason, because Jay was the person sure. who did all this. But he was very instrumental, and he was extremely instrumental in bringing over one game in particular in 1996, and that is Catan. You cannot talk about Mayfair without Catan, and honestly, the company would not have made it to 2018 without Catan. Sure. Uh, Catan was easily their bread and butter. Every year when we would go to convention, it was, here's Catan, here's all the other games, 
and all the other games put together was not as big for them as Catan was. Uh, Catan was that whole, there, there's a whole lot of them. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about Catan in a bit, I'm sure. But after Catan, they started bringing over more and more games. Tigers and Euphrates was one they were well known for. Hey, that's my fish. They started working with Phalanx games, Saboteur, um, Lords of Vegas, Pillars of the Earth. They did more games with Cosmos. They started working with Martin Wallace, Automobile and Steam. These are just some of the games that they came. Then in 19, in 2013, they made their second big change, which helped the company out considerably, and that's when they bought Lookout Games. That was a big change. That was. At this point, Lookout didn't have ties with anybody. Their very first game at Gricola, they had done with Z-Man, although that license eventually expired and went to Mayfair for a while. Mm -hmm. um, so Lookout, of course, these are some of the more popular Lookout games, Caverna, La Havre, and Patchwork. These all came from Mayfair and Lookout together. Basically, Mayfair used the Lookout brand. And interestingly, the Lookout brand, while owned by Mayfair, never felt like Mayfair games. Mm -hmm. It felt like a, just Mayfair was in charge, but they let Lookout. The quality, the look of the games was 100% different than the Mayfair games. Well, I, felt, I felt that way when they were working with Phalanx games, actually. Myself. That's true, right? Because they were doing like Maharaja, right? They were doing a lot of these, uh, you know, uh, Kramer games like Maharaja. Like um, I remember, I had uh, Mesopotamia. That was a Klaus Jurgen Reed game, and there were these extremely well done, beautiful, very. They very much felt like we went to Germany usually and found this game and brought it back with those sensibilities and components and quality already built in. We're just bringing it over here. So I, I felt that way, and, and Lookout followed that that pattern. You know, uh, Phalanx was a, a great partner for them. Lots of good games there. It was a good thing they got Lookout because in 2016 they sold their main money maker, Catan, to Asmodee. After a name change, actually, the it was Settlers of Catan, right? And they changed yeah, it to yeah. Catan. Yeah. So just to be clar clarifying, Mayfair never actually was not the original publisher of Settlers of Catan, but they bought the worldwide English rights to it, which is a pretty big deal. Yes. And they ended up selling those to Asmodee, who was buying uh, everything else. Um, then in 2018, just a little, a little less than a year ago, Asmodee bought Mayfair Games and kept Lookout Games. And Mayfair Games was dissolved. And Mayfair Games is no more and will probably be something we talk about in, well, we're talking about it now, like it's in the history books. Right. So Mayfair Games is definitely a company for me that they're known for Catan for sure, but I also knew them as a very big sponsor of conventions. Mm -hmm. They were easily the biggest sponsor of Origins for decades. Uh, they sponsored, they had a huge booth at Gen Con to the point that when they were bought by Asmodee, we were like, who gets that booth? Yes. Because it was a big, giant <laughs> chunk. Space. They were known for bringing huge versions of their games to cons, mm -hmm. the giant uh, and giant sheep. Uh, near, they did various things throughout the years. They did a little sheep for sheep uh, puppet show mm -hmm. uh, video things that they've done. They started a simple line of games, but I think they did a lot of good things and they did things that I didn't agree with. I was never a huge fan of their component quality ever. Mm -hmm. Like lookout games were and failings, I guess. The rest of them were never, even in 2017, when they were publishing their final games, we were kind of like, come on, Mayfair. Let's get with the times a little sure, bit. Sure, sure. And that's a tricky thing that affects a lot of companies, really, this idea of growing with the times and adjusting. You know, I mean, the, the component quality is one of the most obvious things to sort of look at and go, yep, that's behind the curve as of right now. I don't know where that comes from, if that's previous ties to manufacturers that they don't want to sever, you know what I mean? Uh, I'm not sure. I couldn't put my finger on it. I don't know that, that side of the business, but um, it seems to happen to a lot of these companies that have been around for a long time. Could just be a mindset. I mean, we, just got, we, we just got through reading that quote from, uh, I can't remember who else it was, but um, about how, you know, games used to be about the mechanisms and all of this other kind of stuff. Oh, from but Malaya, now yes. it's Yeah, from Alea. Mm -hmm. um, and and now it's more about how the game looks as well as all this. so it's just a uh, old guard sure old but it guard happens mentality. in every business blockbuster video could have moved with the times but they chose not to and then yeah. they went out of business and i think that happened to mayfair it also seems like with mayfair that once they sold Catan, 
they acted as if they still had Catan money. Mm -hmm. Like, we went to the next convention, we we're like, okay, I bet you Catan, the Mayfair will have a small booth. No. And I know the prices of putting going to these conventions, it's, it's huge amounts of money, and they didn't have the games that people were lining up to buy. They just didn't. If you said, what are the hot, you know, Mayfair games, it was a few lookout games, whatever the new lookout games were, and Catan and its various incarnations. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't mean to jump all over Mayfair. They had a really good run. <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, it's better than most. 37 year run for a company is pretty strong. Most companies that are on the market now have been out for much less time than that. And most of the companies that were out at the same time as Mayfair were gone way before that. Oh yeah. The biggest thing Mayfair did was bring Catan to America. Now, we talked earlier, yeah. Sam, Sam and I are not quite as enamored with Catan as we once were. <laughs> no. I mean, I, I used to play Catan. Uh, I remember downloading a PC version. Mm -hmm. I actually downloaded a PC version of, of Catan, and, and I would, you know, before I went to bed at night, I would play a couple of games of it because that's how fast it was. Sure. You could play against a couple of other bots. And I used to do that every night, um, way back in the day. <coughs> but... It just kind of ran out. I mean, you know, it's just not fun anymore. And it's not necessarily because I played it too much, because I really didn't play it too much at the table. It was just more digitally. But it's just not, not that fun anymore. But it still is a game that a lot of people like. Oh, yeah. sure, sure. And it's directly one of the main things that changed gaming. When this game came to America, there was a lot of games over. I mean, I showed you Manhattan. Manhattan, I think, is a fantastic, amazing game. But it didn't even come close to making the splash that Catan did. They were the Spiel's Yards winners back to back, and Catan just, Catan changed everything. You talk to people now, you know, we'll meet people and we'll say, I have a review board games, and like, oh, have you heard of this game, Catan? It's almost, it's almost pop culture at this point. Well, you mean, can talk other, about Catan. It shows up Big Bang Theory. Shows I up in other so. stuff. I think it's there. What other game has the moniker that the Green Bay Packers will play a game of Catan in their locker room? Well, none actually. But exactly, that's what I'm talking <laughs> about. That's, <laughs> that's the kind of reach that it had. Uh, nothing that isn't clearly mass market. Yeah. But they took Catan, and I mean, they did it with Cosmos, and Cosmos did the same thing. Both companies were living off Catan for a long time. Mm -hmm. They had Settlers of Catan, and then a five to six player expansion, and many, 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 many expansions. Then two player game, the space game, the two player space game. They made a line of games that were in the Catan universe and stuff. But when I would go to a convention, the Catan would be the big center of their thing. Giant Catan and sheep big and stuff. Big tournaments also, that was a big part of it. But they also were huge in train games. If you sure. are a train gamer, you know Mayfair. When I would go to the Puffing Billy, which is a section at conventions that plays train games only. I would say more than half the games are Mayfair. Right. With them having all the Cran Railroad games, several of the 18XX games, the uh, Steam from Martin Wallace. What other train games are there? I mean, there are some, but the heavy Euro gamers, the heavy, I shouldn't say Euro games, because train games and Euro gamers are two different birds. But the train gamers liked Mayfair. Mm -hmm. So, the uh, top 10 list of games that are most, I sorted them by most rated. Okay. So one is obviously Catan. Catan, yeah. What do you think number two is? From them. Um, are we including Lookout Games in we it? We are including Lookout Games. And it is a Lookout Game. <clears throat> but it may not be the one you're thinking of. Boy, uh, I would just go with the white, with the elephant in the room, and I'd say Agricola. No, it's not Agricola, actually. It's, it's a smaller game. It's a small game. Pat Two player. Oh, oh, patchwork. You did something. Patchwork, yeah. yeah. Patchwork. That's that's a two-player game that's really gone over well. That's I mean, gone over really amazingly, well. yeah. Then three is Caverna. Mm -hmm. Their fourth most popular game is uh, from a. Uh, basically a pairing they had with DV Giochi for a while. Mm -hmm. Bang. And they brought Bang over. And while we barely talk about Bang these days, when it was big, Bang, was, bang was everywhere. Also a huge hit, yes. I go to conventions and it was Bang, 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 Bang. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that makes sense. It works. <laughs> bang, bang, bang. It works. Um, then Tigers and Euphrates. For a while, that also was the hit. Euro game to play. Mm -hmm. 
uh, La Havre, then Saboteur, which was a small little card game. Hey, that's my fish. They were the first to make it, maybe? It's been made by, except I think, four for, different publishers. Except for the one that was sort of not made with a big publisher that the, that the designer made, yes. And then No Thanks, which eventually Z-Man picked up. Right. Well, actually, Z-Man did it first. Then Mayfair had it. There was a lot of... It was especially weird with Lookout being bought because when Lookout was bought by Mayfair, they had a lot of licenses already in play. Mm-hmm. Z-Man already had Agricola and um, Lahab, I think. Mm-hmm. They had two of the games. And there was other games that were in play. And as time went by, Mayfair, once those contracts ran out, Mayfair said, all right, it comes back to us. So Agricola came back to them, and they made a family version of Agricola. That's right. And they did a few other things. Um, but, yeah, it's just, it's kind of sad for me to go to a convention and not see Mayfair. I, you know, we went to... Origins without Mayfair, and it was noticeably not there for me. Mm-hmm. They bought giant banners every year. They, we were always by their booth. Remember the, the $5 games? Mm-hmm. Mayfair produced so many games, and when they produce games, they obviously print it in huge print runs. Yeah. yeah, they must have. Because you could go there a couple years later after the game came out, and no one's playing them anymore, and you could buy them. And this was before we had the glut of games. Mayfair was ahead of the curve on that. <laughs> <laughs> the gun, the glut of games. Yeah. So, I, I, I have good thoughts on them as a company. What do y'all think? Uh, again, part of me thinks that they were, again, sort of a product of their time, so their games didn't quite keep up with the times. But um, they put out a lot of... They, they were one of those companies that did work with a lot of other publishers and designers. I remember I, uh, I had my... Uh, copy of Sheer Panic from uh, the brothers. Uh, Traeger brothers. Yeah, and I, I, I thought that production was fantastic. And that was the kind of thing that sometimes they would do, these little publications from corners of gaming that you might not have access to. Mayfair got in there, they brought it over, and they made it available. And it gave you a window into, you know, a window into other places and other sort of design schools and ideas. I thought Mayfair was great for that. There were a few companies like that. They were one of the big players in that space. Then everybody kind of started doing that. But um, that's that's sort of how I think of the company now. You know, that's the biggest thing. Well, it was Mayfair or Rio Grande. Pretty much. Back in the 90s, that was it. You got, until Z-Man entered yeah, the Z-Man arena. Yeah, Z-Man came around and, and sort of, you know, raided Japan, it felt like. Uh, <laughs> For uh, little games, uh, but before that, yeah, yeah, all Phalanx games, those were big, you know, those long, really uh, sort of fancy boxes, uh, those had a lot of presence to them. Yeah, I think Phalanx was probably more, I was more connected with them than I, than I was with actual Mayfair proper. Um, you know, Alexander the Great, Mesopotamia, those are a couple of the ones that I have, mm-hmm. I've had on my shelves in the past, but really kind of... Uh, Mayfair, I guess, just wasn't my kind of company, uh, generally speaking. I mean, yeah, they had Catan that, you know, pretty much, you know, everybody and their mothers played, so so to speak. That's, that's an over-exaggeration. But beyond Catan, there really hasn't been... Well, you liked a lot of their small card games. Bang, No Thanks, Saboteur. No, I didn't like Saboteur. Oh, you didn't like Saboteur? No, I didn't like Saboteur. You did like Bang, though. Bang and No Thanks, yeah. Those were the two card games. That, that Martin Wallace sword game. That uh, Yeah, and Toledo was the one that I bought at that $5 yeah. store that they had that one year. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's been hit or miss, I guess you could say, with me for Mayfair. It hasn't really been a, you know, a misty-eyed, I'm going to miss them, that they're gone type thing now. Uh, I... That sounds cold, but I know what you mean. We can't yeah, I mean, cry over it, every it's company. Just, it's, it's just not. Um, they they just weren't as big of a company for me as they were for other people. That's it. All right. Well, before we go any farther, let's take a moment and see what some of our contributors have to say about Mayfair Games. Hello, my name is Jonathan from Board Game Opinions. Now, when I first got into gaming, I don't think I could have told you what a publisher really was. I mean, I was sort of vaguely aware that they got their 
logo on the corner of the box, but what does a publisher actually do? It was always a bit like Chandler's job from Friends. You know, you were kind of aware that he did work, but you weren't really sure what it involved. Well, I've kind of discovered over the years what a publisher does, and I think a great analogy for this is a bit like building a house. Imagine you have this project to build a house, and you're gonna need lots of different people to help you build a house. You're gonna need an architect to design the house. That's like the design of the game. You're gonna need builders who kind of put the bricks on top of each other and make the physical house. That's like the manufacturers of the game. You'll need interior decorators to do the painting or wallpapering, whatever it is, a bit like the artists. But you really need a project manager a group or a person who can bring all these other people together, who can sort of allocate the timetables when the different bits of work need to be done, make sure one bit of work gets passed to the next person, etc. So the whole thing comes together as a quality product at the end. And essentially that's what a publisher is doing. In order to produce a board game like this, there's lots of different components that need to go into it. So you've got obviously the artists and the designers and everything, and coordinating all those people is a tricky job. It's a very technical job, it requires a great deal of attention to detail. So publishers who do a good job really stand out, although unfortunately we don't tend to notice them very much, and often the ones you don't notice are the good ones. When things go wrong, that's when you tend to notice it. And they've already done, Mayfair have done a number of famous games over the years, uh, with very high quality components I think, but the one that really stood out for me was one of the very first games I ever got in my collection, which is The Settlers of Catan, as it was known back then, it's now just Catan. This is my old original copy. Um, but when this first came out, board games were not really, they didn't have great components. A lot of them were just cheap plastic rubbish, uh, thin paper money and things. And when Mayfair were producing games, they their quality really stood out. You know, they used sort of nice wooden painted pieces. They had decently thick cardboard tiles and things. And these things made a difference. I mean, Catan was obviously a great game, but one of the decisions a publisher has to make is how much to spend manufacturing the various components of the game. Obviously, the more money you spend, the more money you might potentially lose if it's not going to be a success. And although now, looking back on it, you sort of think, oh yeah, Catan's a very famous game, it's done very well, and it's, the publisher has certainly made the money back here. But at the time, nobody really knew. And so Mayfair were taking a risk, if you like, um, in investing the money to manufacture the game. But they chose to make a good, high-quality game with good, high-quality components. And that really stands out to me. When I played this, I played it with my friends, I'm like, oh, these are... These are really nice pieces, good quality, aren't they? <laughs> Compared with all the other board games that we've been playing at the time. And they've just continued to do really high quality games. You know, Caverna's got some fantastic quality pieces in it. And it's, you know, with all the sort of modern games with lots of super high quality minutes and things, it's hard to really think back to what games were like. Um, but Mayfair really took a step up in terms of production quality. And I really appreciate that. You know, there are plenty of companies who don't have the highest quality of components. But Mayfair, for me, really stand out as one of those companies that do. Hi world, I'm Ellen. And I am Randy. Uh, where we game together. And today we're talking about Mayfair Games. Ever heard of it? I have. I had, had you? I had not until <laughs> not long enough ago. So Ellen's not one to pay attention to publishers and designers Ever. very much. And yeah. I'm not really that much either. And, you know, there's like pressure, I feel, from there people to like, you don't bit. know the publisher? You don't know this? Like, what are you, stupid? <laughs> I'm like, a little bit, but You know, I, I try to know. pay attention, but like, you know, if I like a game or don't like a game. Yeah, you know, I gotta say. But anyways, I we're talking just, about I Mayfair. I don't pay attention to that too much, I don't I either. I feel kind of bad. So. But anyway, so Mayfair right. Games, they brought over a lot of the Euro games um, early on, um, which we're very grateful for. We, we love Euro games. Yeah. We were not into board games when that was really happening. True. Uh, we got into it maybe four-ish years ago, and you got into it, like, what, two and a half? Two and a like, half. Kind yeah. of a newbie still. I think we're both fairly new. I think five yeah. years is pretty new. Yeah. I guess it is, Yeah. Because there's a lot of people in this hobby that are they're like, oh, I'm going on 20 They've been years. in for a long year, long, just long, long time. Uh, so, I, you know, we did a little research on Mayfair we did, games. We did a little. We didn't want to sound totally <laughs> dumb. Mostly meaning just I wanted to look up all the games that Mayfair has done. And uh, and we obviously looked on our shelves and yeah. things. And I found that we own four games that are made by Mayfair. Uh, Caverna. Mm -hmm. Isle of Baron Sky. Baron Park. Yeah. Isle of Sky. And Patchwork. Patchwork. I then found out that they're really lookout games that Mayfair has also produced. So I don't frauds. think we actually have we are frauds. or have played any like original Mayfair titles <clears throat> or even from many of them that they brought over pretty early on. Yeah. Um, I know Catan is like one of the huge ones. 
And that is a game that I've actually never played. I've never played Catan either. Is this like a must? I don't know. No. I don't, I don't really so. want to. I mean, there's just so many good games out there. I think it's. I've never felt the desire. I mean, I'm, obviously, Catan has done so much for the hobby. Yes. It's brought Thank you. it to mainstream for a lot of people. Yeah. You hear it all over the place. Like when when somebody's playing an advanced game, it's it's some kind of Catan. Like yeah. the uh, Green Bay Packers in our neck of the woods, the team would actually <laughs> play Catan together. I did and so that was like a, that was like a story that. and things like that that they would play in together. Yeah, that is so cute. Yeah, so it's just there's no Bonding. question that it's a great game, and it's kind of one of those good fun to hate on it now, hmm. just because it's you know that. it's it's that well that's the one that gets you into the hobby. <laughs> but it's if it wasn't for Catan, yeah. who knows where we would be? That is true. In the hobby. Thank you, Catan. Thank you, Mayor, Mayfair Games, <laughs> for that. Right. <laughs> for real. So that's that's kind of our take on it. Um, I've I found that like I said, Lookout Games is is through Mayfair has been great. But if it wasn't for Mayfair, they probably wouldn't be here. True. So. So thank you, Mayfair. Thank you again. Yeah, we're gonna just say thank you about twelve more times, and then we'll end this thing. <laughs> Speaking of ending it, let's end it. Let's end it. We'll see you later, guys. Bye. Hello, as Druval here. Now, back in the day, I did hear about Mayfair Games about 1990, but, you know, I didn't want to have anything to do with them because I was a Milton Bradley slash Parker Brothers snob. But in 1997, a friend of mine introduced me to Settlers of Catan, and that changed my whole world. I didn't know what modern board gaming could be until I played that game. I'm not going to be talking about that game, but I'm going to be talking about one of my favorite titles from Mayfair, and that's Lords of Vegas, published in 2010. Now, in this game, you are trying to get the best lots on the Vegas Strip, and you're going to build casinos, rolling dice to try to get a high roll to take control of the casinos. And what you want to do is expand your casinos to make them bigger, all while trying to have the highest number of dice so you can remain in control. Well, this is my pick for the Dice Tower Dive, it is Lords of Vegas. Check it out. Hello, and welcome to another, if you like that, you might like this segment with Graham Anderson. Now, since we're not talking about a specific game this week, but a publisher, I thought I'd have a look at some of my favorite games from them. I'll be looking at a short, medium, and longer length game from Mayfair. Now, my short game is one called Saboteur with its expansion, Saboteur 2. Now, players take on the role of dwarves, and as miners, they're digging into a mine hunting for gold. But, of course, not all the dwarves want to share the rewards and can sabotage their fellow dwarves. Now, there are going to be three gold cards placed on the table face down, with one of them being the gold card. On a player's turn, they will either play a tunnel card, which has to be placed connected to an existing tunnel, an action card, which can either hinder another dwarf's progress or remove a hindrance from another dwarf, or they can just pass. Now, the miners are trying to reach the gold card with the gold nugget on it, and the saboteurs want them to reach one of the other gold cards, and after three rounds, whomever has the most gold is the winner. Now, since this is a social deduction game where you don't know who is on what team at the beginning of the round, your goal is to help your teammates. Now, it is fairly quick and allows you to try and convince everyone that you are on their team. Now, this is a type of game I like, where you can look people right in the eye and say, I have no cards that can help, while holding a handful of extremely useful cards for their team. Again, that is Saboteur. Now, a middle-length game I want to talk about is called Riverboat. Now, this game lasts about 90 minutes to 2 hours, and you play as owners of a 19th century farm on the banks of the Mississippi River. You need to organize your workers to make sure that the crops are planted according to the type and harvested when they're ready so you can ship them down to New Orleans. Now during each of the four rounds players will get uh, to draft the phase cards and then in phase order everyone will get to do the action in the phase. But the person who holds the phase card will get a bonus. The phases are things like getting the fields ready by placing your workers onto the field board then getting the crops to plant in phase two then you need to harvest one type of crop in phase three along with loading up your riverboat then you can launch your riverboats in phase four, and you can collect bonus victory points in phase five. Now, there's a lot of things I really like in this game. The drafting of the phase card. Everyone gets to do a phase, but the person that has the phase card gets a bonus when they're doing it. 
planning out your garden to try and harvest the largest group of vegetables you can, and getting the right riverboat and moving your portmaster along the port. This game is not overly complex, but there are a number of things to be looking at and watching for. A great way to spend an hour and a half. Now the final game I want to talk about is actually a style of game, and that's the Crayon Rails. Now I have several Crayon Rail games, but my favorite, I'd have to say, is Iron Dragon. Now this is a train game that plays place in a fantasy world where your engines are actually dragons. Now the games do last around four hours, but it's not an overly complex game. You need to be building routes to pick up and deliver goods to fulfill orders. You start with a certain amount of money and then you need to draw. That's right, you actually draw with crayons on the board which route you want to build. You need to carefully manage your money as you need to fulfill demand cards before you get any more money. Now the original Crayon Rail games was Empire Builder, but I prefer the fantasy theme in it, Iron Dragon, plus the little rules changes it introduces are interesting. So if you're looking for a longer train game that is not overly complex, then Iron Dragon is definitely one to check out. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I'd love to hear what your favourite Mayfair games are in the comments. And we're back! Okay, so... Well, first of all, we need to mention... Settlers and Catan, apparently the same thing. <laughs> you heard it here first, folks. I did not realize that. It's interesting that for, we call it Settlers for a long time, then they actually took Settlers of out of the name. Yeah. yeah it was the Settlers of Catan translated from the German. And then people were like, Settlers, never going to call it Catan. Settlers became the thing. Yeah, and then Catan was actually the part that stuck around, which makes sense. But I, I wish they I hadn't still, done that, though. I still say Settlers, I think. Because if you're playing the other game, Starfarers of Catan or Seafarers of Catan, just Catan, even a Star Trek Catan. That's just and called, Game of Thrones Catan. Just call that Star Trek. Well, Catan is not gone. Still around Asmodee controls it. There's a whole department at Asmodee that's only about Catan. Mm. But Mayfair is gone, unfortunately. But back in the day, Mayfair... I, we were talking while uh, off break here that the Cosmic Encounter, that was my resurgence into Cosmic Encounter, was the Mayfair version. Mm -hmm. Now it has easily the worst components <laughs> of the series, has the most rules of the series, and some people, I mean, but it was still fun. Yeah, you, I, I owned it for a while, till pr pretty recently, actually. and um, It was a Kickstarter before Kickstarters. That sure, more Cosmic yes, Encounter yes. that came with all that stuff, yeah. that happened not from a Kickstarter stretch goal. That's right. Just a bunch of guys threw stuff in a box. It was everything, all sorts of crazy stuff in there. But um, there were still, there's rules in that Cosmic Encounter that I still, to this day, say are better than the new ones. I like my um, my one use uh, flares. Is that what they're called, flares? The, yes. The um, I, Were they called flares? Oh, I'm getting all, I, I get them all anyway, mixed up. The alien powers, anyway. The alien powers, I like the one use alien powers myself still. Yes, components were rough. I those disagree, but... Those alien uh, illustrations are something to behold. I'll put it that way. Well, that's pretty much it for taking a look at, uh, at Mayfair, unless you guys had any other thoughts. I, I, again, I, we got to give them a lot of props. Bags. Nope, they were all up there. Oh. <laughs> no, I mean, they, they did a lot of good for the hobby. And all, there was a lot of employees for Mayfair over the years. Many of them still involved in the hobby, just at different companies. Yeah. The people in Mayfair working with Catan, several of them moved on with Asthma Day in Catan. Um, a few people from Mayfair retired when the, the day came by. Mayfair was really good at promoting stuff. I've never seen a company promote, well, other than Bonacor, I guess, on his own. But well, Mayfair, though, was also willing to spend money in their promotions. And they promote it like all get out. I mean, they would, they, they would go for licenses like Star Trek Catan. They would. Well, it stuck around for a long time for a reason. Yeah, they. You know, it wasn't accidental that they lasted much longer than all of uh, a lot of these other companies that were around during that time. Uh, they, they knew what they were doing in many ways, but it is an industry that keeps accelerating around anyone who's been around in the game. You know, around in in doing that for a long time, that pace is just picking up around you. And that's going to happen. You're going to start falling behind in, you know, things like component quality. I also have to give Mayfair credit. They have the best single marketing idea I've ever seen at a convention with the ribbons. Mm. The wood, sheep, the brain thing. Ribbons, yeah. It was so good that all the other companies were like, 
we're doing that too. Yeah. And they had people trading the ribbons. They, they took the idea of Catan and just ran with it. Yeah. And they would have games that I would think were mediocre at best, and they would come to a convention and act like it was the greatest game on earth, <laughs> have huge version of them. Like, who asked for a huge version of this game? Mayfair's like, we don't care. You're going to love it. <laughs> so I can't, you know, there you go. So, but they, they brought, they're definitely instrumental in bringing the Euro game hobby to America. Right. So good for them. Yeah. Thank you to all our contributors. Thank you to Sam and Z and to our editing staff and video staff. We'll see you guys in two weeks for another Dice Tower Dive. We'll be back tomorrow morning for Board Game Breakfast. Until then, I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Z Garcia. Have a good one. Sam Healy. See you on the flip side, folks. Take care. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool Stuff, in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.